Hello everyone. On behalf of the entire uh, KCL Poetry Society, I would like to warmly welcome you to this event. Furthermore, I would like to welcome our today's speaker, Radosław Sikorski, and thank him for accepting our invitation to King's College London. Uh, Radosław Radek Sikorski is a member of the European Parliament for his native uh, region in Poland, member of the Committee of Foreign Affairs, the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in the Digital Age, and the Subcommittee on the Security and Defense. He also chairs the delegation for relations with the United States. He's a senior fellow at the Center of European Studies at Harvard University and distinguished statesman at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Formerly, Mr. Sikorski has served at Poland as a Poland Minister of Defense from 2005 to 2007, Minister of Virgin Affairs from 2007 to 2014, and Marshal of the same of the Republic of Poland from 2014 to 2015. Between 1986 and 1989, Sikorski was a war correspondent in Afghanistan and Anglo. Together with Karl Belt, he initiated the EU Eastern Partnership. He also proposed establishing the European Endowment for Democracy and Solidarity Prize. In 2014, at the height of mass protests against Ukrainian President Viktor Yukovych, he led the EU mission to Kiev, which stopped the bloodshed uh, on the Maidan. In 2012, Foraging Policy magazine named him one of its top 100 global thinkers for telling the truth even when it's not democratic. Diplomatic. Oh, diplomatic, you're very right. Sorry. Um, our discussion with the moderator, Julia Karpinska, is a third year comparative literature student at King's, an external speaker associate at our Polish Society. Today, she will hold the discussion with Mr. Sikorski for about 45 minutes, followed by the questions from the audience that you will have the opportunity to ask. I will ask all of you to put uh, your phone on silence mode, so that doesn't disrupt our event. And without further ado, Yuri Kambrisa, Karpinska, and Mr. Skorsky. As we discussed, we were working with the Polish District in Bush House for 30 years ago as a young war correspondent straight from Oxford, a political refugee. You went to pick up your radio from BBC and you were on the way to Afghanistan. And now we are here, Poles, and you're a former Polish minister, and Poland is free. That's a long journey, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, in those days, um, Poland was unfree. Ah, right. Can show you okay. Um, yeah, sure. Well, in the 1980s, Poland was unfree, but the, the tendency was towards the collapse of communism, and I'm not sure the tendency is so good these days. Uh, especially that you have a skill for writing prophetic articles, just like the wrote to one, the National Review, in 1989, the crack up of communism, um, and as you are saying, that you you have skills that prof that are prophetic for the events that are going to occur that many people lack. And I was wondering if it's a skill that you acquired at Oxford, or is it just a good observation of human behavior? I'm glad you mentioned that piece because I'm particularly proud of it. Uh, some people claim that nobody uh, predicted the fall of communism. Um, including, of course, the CIA. Um, uh, but I can prove I did, because uh, um, it was a, f a cover page article in, uh, the, in National Review. Yeah. Um, and by the way, an anthology of my journalism is, uh, is uh, coming out in January um, in Polish translation, but um, you know, uh, stretching back 35 years. Um, I hope uh, you get it for all your friends and family. Right. Um, also, your experience in Oxford, we discussed how the institutions have changed. What are the biggest differences that you observe right now as a former alumni that weren't there when you were a student? Well, I wouldn't know because I'm not there. Uh, yeah, I know, but you're observing how the institutions are evolving. and. Your children are our age, so. Yeah, but they didn't go to uh, Oxbridge, uh, much to my regret. Um, um, followed the mummy to Yale. Um, uh, but you know, Oxford.
Oxford is, um, I mean, in one way it changed, and now it's changing back. Namely, when I was president of the Oxford University Polish Society, it numbered a dozen members. Uh, when I last visited, it was 200 something members. And I'm told that um, matriculations for this year or next are down 70% uh, because of the because of Brexit and the raising of fees, uh, because people find that they can um, uh, that there are perfectly good universities in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in in, 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 in Germany, and if you're if you can pay 26,000 pounds, then you can probably pay 35,000 dollars in the U.S. But also the program has changed, I feel. Like it's not as Eurocentric as it was. And it applies to most of universities that they are becoming more global, but people are not going to count because of the fees and how hermetic actually the United Kingdom is becoming. It's something that actually you predict as well. I think at Bridge University, when you said that it's not going to be another Switzerland, it's going to be a place of money laundering and it's going to become a way of a tax heaven. And uh, Britain was supposed to become even more global, as you say, as a result of Brexit. But actually, you know, Xi Jinping of um, China is now discouraging the Chinese from studying abroad. So the continentals, uh, Poles included, will probably not be uh, replaced by the Chinese at some British universities. Uh, it's terrible. It's um, you know, just as on the continent we are moving towards greater academic exchanges, I'm a great fan of the idea of um, making it compulsory for students on the continent to spend one academic term at a university in another member country. Okay. I, I think it would be good for people to uh, get to know one another. Um, Britain actually had the option of remaining in the Erasmus uh, program despite Brexit, but didn't uh, take up the option, so um, I think it's a shame. I would say that in general we were experiencing a crisis of brand concepts, mentors and authorities in a society, I mean people we can look up to, and as we were discussing how we should actually become more global, I mean the financial elites in the past were also intellectual elites and now we're moving away from the trend. I feel like the only place is actually is coast of the US. While here in Europe it's not about education anymore and priding yourself in attending a renowned institution. Yeah, but um, when you look at the numbers of engineers or computer scientists that China is producing, um, it's an order of magnitude greater than all of the EU or all of the US. Um, I mean, humanities are, you know, I studied them myself, uh, you know, greatly to be admired, but these technologies of the future, AI, quantum, uh, biotech, uh, you know, you, you need really highly skilled technical people, and if, and if we don't produce them at our universities, then, um, the global division of labor in future will be to our disadvantage with all kinds of consequences for our, for our standard of living. Yes, and touching on that as well, how our society, especially that millennials and Gen, Gen Z is evolving. Um, I know if you're familiar, there was a large study conducted in Britain where it, was, um, it resulted that 67% of young people want to live in an authoritarian society, in a socialist society, even if it's authoritarian. You, as a former um, admirer of um, Mrs. Thatcher, I was wondering what's your outlook on that, how it's evolved in two generations, actually, in the UK. Mrs. Thatcher was a controversial and divisive figure, but she was um, aspirational, she was ambitious, she represented the idea of, uh, of, uh, of social advancement and of hard work and of perfectionism. Whereas what I feel is happening um, in many Western societies, including my own, is an assault on the very idea of meritocracy. Uh, you know, in, in Poland, I really 
think that's at the root of, um, of, of the problem we have with the ruling party. Um, because meritocracy as applied to politics and the economy uh, fundamentally uh, mean that the best people should succeed, namely either because they present their ideas most forcefully and they get the vote, or they produce the best goods and services and they make the money, right? And I feel that large swathes of our society have come to the conclusion that, that, that that's unfair. Uh, and in Poland, the idea is that why should we have meritocracy? If we have meritocracy, then some random people win just because they happen to be the best. Whereas actually, the economy should be owned and the government should be done by patriots. And who says who's a patriot? The chairman of the party. Uh, and, and, and so tribal identity and tribal solidarity trumps meritocracy, which is a terrible atavism, you know, because tribal solidarity is, some, is something that even chim chimpanzees feel. Um, um, it's some kind of terrible, terrible regression in the development of humanity. Yeah, and this also applies to the crisis of brand concepts and willing to work for something greater than only financial income. And right, whereas the Chinese, you know, are like we were until recently, they are willing to work their guts out in order to succeed, right? Yeah, but also we are exper experiencing from the past years a rise in populism in Europe. And that was actually uh, one of the factors was the uneven distribution of goods after the financial crisis, as it is claimed. Exactly, as it is claimed. I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that the uh, um, economic argument explains populism. Because uh, it is a global phenomenon. Central Europe, Western Europe, Britain, United States. And, and in the West, they tend to be far more Marxist than, than, than we are in the East. They think that the base, the time in superstructure, if you get the economy wrong and you get the political results and vice versa. And I'm not sure it works because uh, in Poland, we got a populist government after 25 years of unprecedented growth. Yeah. The fastest catching up by Poland of the Western European standard of living in our 1,000 year history. Um, in the US, Mr. Trump, uh, you know, the definition of a populist, um, seems to have a chance to return, even though the only thing he did as president was to cut taxes for the rich, uh, which, which was terrible for, him, for, for his base. Um, you could argue that in Poland, you know, the overall success of the country didn't reflect the, uh, you know, fair distribution uh, between the socio-economic classes. Uh, but no, I think populism has more to do with uh, the communications revolution and with cultural factors. Um, nationalism taking the place of religion, for example. You know, Poland and, and the United States, for example, are the countries which were until recently quite religious, and where you have the sharpest drop in, in, in religiosity. And communications, you know, the Gutenberg press gave us uh, reformation, newspapers gave us the French Revolution, uh, radio gave us communism and, and fascism. And the social media stuff is of course e even more uh, fundamental and, and radical. Because it's not just a means of communicating, the algorithms actually encourage division, as we know. So it is in the economic interest of the owners of algorithms for us to be divided and to hate one another. And, and by the way, we should do something about it. And we used to have different opinions, but now we have different facts. Completely. Completely. I find it impossible to talk to some people in Poland. My, my, book, my wife wrote a book about it. But you know, during elections, you, you meet the kinds of people you don't normally meet. You, know, you go to bazaars and streets and so on. And um, 
and I meet people whom you cannot convince because they have a completely different set of facts. A fixed idea. Um, I, I, I mean, I love debate, you know. I, I, I recently went to a rally by uh, Polish uh, anti-vaccine people and, I spent, see, I see. and spent an hour arguing with them, but, but I don't think I can convince a single person. Uh, actually, I'd like to touch on Trump. How would you assess the risk of his return? Because people are saying that the once he lost, he's not going to come back. Looks quite high. The guy doesn't drink. Therefore, might might you know? I mean, he, he eats junk food but doesn't drink, so he might live quite a long time. Um, I mean, my Democrat friends were claiming that once he you loses power, he will go to jail. Uh, you know, I believed them, so I you know even publicly said that you know he, will, in anticipation, pro he'll probably skip the country and live um, uh, 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 hedge by hedge with President Yanukovych and Rostov on Don, you know. And there he is, you know, uh, still in charge of the Republican Party, and they've just excluded Liz Cheney, uh, effectively, from the Republican Party. So he seems to own the Republican Party now. And it's pretty scary, um, because um, I'm not sure the US, as a can survive as a de democracy in other Trump terms. Yeah, especially that he has, he is, he is charismatic and people follow him and almost religiously. As you said, nationalism replaced religion, so, and now he's building his media empire, his own version of Twitter or Facebook. And, you know, he represents the kind of politician uh, about whom if you proves that he's, you know, has lied and has committed uh, uh, gross uh, uh, infractions of codes or whatever, it, it, you know, to, to his followers, it doesn't matter. You, I mean, you cannot harm the guy. Actually, the same board. No, no matter. For slightly different reasons. Um, but yes, and there are some parallels in this country too. Uh, so I was actually thinking how we can get rid of authoritarianism in Poland. Do we do you think that we can simply vote them out? Or is it going to be a need for a bigger coup? Well, the simplest definition of democracy is that it's a system in which the government can lose. And what these people have been doing is creating a, a system in which it's very difficult to dislodge them. Because once you've captured the major institutions, state media, uh, the judiciary, the prosecution service, the security services, the press. Um, I mean, most of you here uh, speak Polish, so you have your own own view about uh, the, the, the the state television in in uh, in Poland. It was never BBC, but imagine if if, um, if say Sky News was uh, taken over by by the editorial uh, staff of, of Breitbart or whatever the UK equivalent is. Um, you know, Goebbelsian propaganda, day in, day out. Uh, um, and, I, and I'm afraid that it works. You know, um, Donald Tusk uh, was a dissident under communism, uh, been a parliamentarian for decades, and achieved the office um, of the President of the European Council, which is, of course, the highest office ever held by a Pope in our history, excluding the Vatican, of course. Um, and, and, um, and he goes back to Poland, and they've already called, they, they, they have this phrase, Für Deutschland. And they've convinced a third of the population that he's not Polish, that he's German. But they actually also convinced a third of the population that Smolensk was a terrorist attack. Yes, so. yes, yes. It, that, it, it's, um, yeah, um, I think that's the, uh, actually a core issue. Um, because 
people forget how Trump started. Um, Birtherism. That's right. So these guys always have to start with a big lie. And this big lie is a kind of gate through which his, their supporters have to go through. Once you can get them to believe complete nonsense for which there is no uh, evidence, they will then believe anything. Because pride forbids from admitting that they were wrong. Um, and um, that's the sort of um, swallowing a big lie is an entry ticket to the sect. And once you create a sect, you, you know, then, then people can be primed to hate, people can be, uh, it, it's very difficult to deprogram such people. You know, what we should be doing is, is get, getting them through de-radicalization programs like we do with jihadis. Hmm? But that's difficult to do. I'm glad you mentioned Tusk because actually as a good example of a politician who is currently renowned and then greatly acknowledged around Europe and around the world, but we, I mean not we, but some people in Poland are struggling with actually considering him a successful politician is actually the opposite. Well, I think it's it's very Well I wish him his I wish everyone his failure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there is a thing that I'm often wondering why is Poland struggling with acknowledging its people who are successful who achieved something? Oh, well, that's, um, that's an imminent feature of uh, our Sarmatian civilization. Um, uh, Poland has always hated people who rise above average. Um, look at uh, how Poland has created Lech Wałęsa by comparison with how South Africa has created, uh, has treated Nelson Mandela. Um, Lech Wałęsa is no saint. He made mistakes. Uh, but neither is um, Nelson Mandela. You know, he started by blowing up uh, McDonald's calves with bombs. Okay, so they both have, you know, things in the past that they that they wouldn't uh, uh, repeat, and yet. Uh, Nelson Mandela has a statue in um, in Parliament Square and is a is a global icon. Whereas Lech Wałęsa is hounded with uh, prosecutions now in Poland. Still. Uh, oh, a new one. Oh. Uh, uh, he's threatened with eight years in jail um, by the Institute of National Memory, which was created by the Solidarity Movement uh, you know, to commemorate the crimes of communism. And they are now prosecuting Lech Wałęsa. So we've destroyed the Lech Wałęsa legend uh, by our own hands. He could have been you know, Poland's great icon because people, some people in Poland cannot ab uh, abide by the thought that somebody is, is more famous or better than them. But look, I mean, the heroes that we have, Marie Curie, or Chopin, everyone thinks they're French, and I know why we're not owning up to what we created as a nation. That's one issue that some, that some people think they're French, but that's just ignorance. The, the more interesting issue is that they were, in both cases, um, they went through hell uh, from their contemporaries. You know, I went um, to the um, Polish religious site called Lichen. I encourage you to go. It's a, it's a feast on many levels. Um, you know, starting with the uh, architectural aesthetics. You have about nine different styles combined in a church which is bigger than St. Peter's. Okay? Um, and, uh, and there's a wonderful huge picture in a side chapel um, of Our Lady with, uh, with child and uh, the Polish nation worshipping them. On the one side you have historical figures, you know, uh, a uh, Husaria um, uh, mounted um, cavalry man and, uh, you know, historical figures, uh, peasants, uh, noblemen, uh, all kinds of people, and on the other hand, uh, representatives of the uh, of all the professions. You know, there's a miner, there's a, there's a 
woodsman, there's a doctor, and um, and the baby Jesus has little white white and red uh, um, um, Polish flags, and uh, the Lady Madonna has Polish ego, and, and you know, and you can have absolutely no doubt that uh, they were both Polish, of course. Of course. And then there is the catacombs, and they have a, they, they have the pantheon of. Um, uh, of famous poles, and that's what I'm driving at. And, uh, and I took a look at all of them. There is Piłsudski, there is, um, who was a Protestant, there is Maya Curie, who, who you know, had a famous scandal uh, in Paris and was hounded by, by, by conservatives. There is Chopin, I was just in Ma Ma Majorca in Val de Mosa, where he spent the summer with um, with Georges Sand, and when the church in Warsaw, which now boasts his um, uh, heart, they didn't want to display it for 30 years because he was a uh, because of his scandalous behavior. So all these people, while they were alive, um, were denounced. So so the only way to start be the only way to start getting respect is to die. Right. And especially, as you said, that we don't know how to treat the living heroes. And, but actually, we as Poland uh, are struggling with building instead of rebuilding. Because, for example, Lenin Bawesa was very successful when he was in opposition, but as a president, he proved to be poor. I, I agree. I didn't vote for him the second time. <laughs> so you voted for Kongs? No, I didn't, go, I didn't vote at all, but I, uh, there was a reason why he, he lost the second time. So once, once we're in Poland, I would like to touch on the events from the past days on the Belarusian borders, on the Polish-Belarusian border, um, especially that you as a foreign minister, you've had quite a lot of dramatic events happening during your term, and now there was an EU intervention without actually consulting it with Poland, so Poland was rejecting also the German help, and I was wondering also not only I was actually going back and thinking, why did it happen? Where is the Frontex money going to? Because if the borders are so easy for immigrants to go through, then how about an actual army? Well, that's a different issue. But I was surprised too, because I had thought that the infrastructure from uh, the communist period, when, when the polish belarusian border was the border between Poland and the USSR, and there were, you know, there was a fence, there were watch tires and all that. I assumed that it was all still there, but it wasn't. Um, um, Lukashenko is clearly trying to do Erdogan, which is to force, which is to say, force the EU into a negotiation and then pay him uh, a tribute for stopping. Um, um, and as you say, Poland has been reluctant to accept EU assistance. Um, and now that this assi assistance is happening anyway, uh, um, I think this crisis is going to be over quite quickly. Uh, because the EU has already um, persuaded Iraq to um, close down Belarusian consulates. And I think the key um, decision will be um, uh, the, the, the EU threat to uh, Middle Eastern airlines, that if they continue to ship migrants to Minsk, they'll lose their license to operate in the EU. And I think this, this is going to work. It's going to cut off the supply of migrants. And I think sooner or later, uh, Lukashenko will conclude that, the, that they are a bigger problem for him than for us. You know, if we can't win with Lukashenko, then we are no good. You know, we, this should not be a negotiated settlement. We should just win it. And we can. And we will Europe. That was not my point. <laughs> but actually, is there something we can do to improve the relations with the current American administration? Because we, we, we love Trump as Poland. Uh, but now there is a different president, if, even though our government didn't notice. But is there anything that you think we can do to improve the relations with Joe Biden? Yes, the same thing that would improve the relations with the EU. Start uh, abiding by our own constitution. Which shouldn't be that difficult. 
but how about the Green Deal? It's a, it's a thing that concerns us all. And my favorite scientist, Leonardo DiCaprio, has been speaking for years about the importance of implementing steps towards the greener future. And Poland's not doing that. And we're on blacklist as well because of that. On the one hand, Poland has a genuine problem because we had, and still do, have the highest proportion of coal generating of electricity. On the other hand, we also have by far the largest number of highly polluted uh, uh, cities. So it's, uh, it's costly, but doubly in our interest to cut down on emissions and on pollution. And the correct approach would have been to, to, to say uh, six years ago, uh, to continue the policy of convincing uh, Europe, saying, look, we, yeah, we understand we want to carry out the program, but understand our situation, we need more of a, and there is this, this solidarity fund of a few billion euros, but it could have been much bigger if Poland had uh, focused on that rather than on building new coal-fired uh, plant and defending, you know, and saying that coal will be there in the mix for 200 years, which it won't be. Um, so, you know, it was one of the ridiculous bad choices that the current uh, government has made. Uh, we need to start abiding our own law. How about we just say that, and I think it was 1987 that Ahmad Shah Massoud said that the Afghan state stickers that you reported on that they actually were in Afghanistan and they need Quran. How has it evolved over the years? What do the Afghans need now? Well, in 1987, remember, uh, Afghanistan was a completely feudal society. Uh, when I traveled there, um, in some places I was the first Western person they've ever seen. And they would call me uh, Ferengi, which doesn't mean foreigner, it means Frank, which is a Quranic term for the Crusaders. Um, it was a, um, a federation of valleys and of tribes and clans. Um, uh, and of course now it's, it's different, you know, Kabul uh, uh, was way below a million people then. It's now a, a metropolis of uh, almost six million people. And mark my words, we're going to have a horrible humanitarian catastrophe there over this winter. Because Ameri the Americans pumped up Afghanistan's economy with billions of dollars, and not only have they left, they've cut off access to uh, the foreign reserves. So the economy has completely collapsed. And Afghans can now draw only $200, I think it's per week, not per day. Um, and half the food would need to be imported, but isn't, because there isn't the money. And um, Afghanistan doesn't produce enough electricity to power the country, Kabul in particular. All the electricity is imported as well, and they don't have the money. Um, I spoke to her just the just day before yesterday, to a woman who'd just come out, out of uh, Kabul, and she says that it's a little different from what we think. The Taliban haven't actually passed on any anti-women or anti-tolerance laws, um, although under the cover of COVID uh, restrictions, women have not fully come back to work at ministries or, at uni or study at universities. But essentially, they've done nothing. These mullahs or these, these uh, battlefield Taliban commanders who'd spent 20 years in the caves have come into the ministries they have absolutely no clue what it's all about. Some of them are illiterate and just sit there, don't make any decisions, nothing. While the economy and the system is slowly grinding to a halt. And unless we step in with some huge um, humanitarian effort, people will starve. It will be horrible. But this claim that if Americans didn't intervene with stinkers, then things would go in a different way. Um, yeah, the Russians could have won. Um, 
Uh, and I, I brought up the first pictures of stingers on the battlefield in 1986, and it did change the war. It, uh, it, it, uh, it, it meant that the Russians couldn't resupply their garrisons by, by air, and it, it meant that they had to either double the number of troops or quit. They quit. Um, and, uh, and the Americans having won, um, dropped Afghanistan then too. Um, and now, this time, they've even closed down the embassy as a political signal, you know, you, China, Russia, Iran, uh, Pakistan, you deal with it now, your problem. Um, um, no, but, but look, that, that, that was a just war because the, the Soviets had invaded a completely peaceful country. Um, uh, but, of course, uh, there were decisions since then that could have uh, changed the uh, course. You know, we could have negotiated with the Najibullah regime, uh, and after the fall of Kabul, when the Taliban lost, the Taliban actually wanted a deal with the Americans. You know, they said, we will give up if you allow our leader, Mullah Omar, to live in dignity in Kandahar and give us an amnesty. And Rumsfeld said no, which was a mistake. Um, so I'm afraid Afghanistan's problems have not ended. It's just that a new and, and possibly even more horrible phase is beginning. Uh, when you were there with the Mujahideens in the 1980s, did you believe that it was actually possible to go from religion to secularism and reforming the country so it could function more normal? Um, it's very difficult uh, because, as you suggest, was an unbelievable. It, it was then and still is the poorest country in Asia. Um, but then it was. It's hard to describe how poor it was. And life happened pretty much like it did in, pro in the Prophet's time. You know, you lived by the movement of the sun and, uh, and, 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 and the seasons and so on. Co completely primitive rural existence in which the sort of Islamic uh, codes and so on sort of made sense were, were traditional and people were used to them and so on you know in some sense um, the tragedy of Afghanistan is the tragedy of failed modernizations you know in the 70s the king tried to do it peace piecemeal then you had the king go, got um, got um, uh, removed by his cousin, and you had a brief secular uh, government trying to modernize. Then you had, then you had the accelerated modernization on the communist mode. You know, all the uh, education of, uh, of everybody and, uh, and 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 attempted industrialization. Then the mujahideen, of course, Islamism, but but not uh, fanatical. Then the Taliban backwards again. Then 20 years of Western occupation, another spurt of modernization, and now another step backwards. You know, I mean, we know something about it in Poland, not as dramatically as this, but but those are the kinds of cycles. See, so if the Russians had one, they would have communism and everyone would live in prosperity, according to current preferences in Europe. Well, I mean, the the. It's, 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 it's difficult because Afghan communists were more fanatical than the Soviets. So, for example, they expropriated land from land landowners and distributed it among peasants, but without water rights. Okay. And in a country like that, water is more important than, than land. Or without uh, turnover capital, uh, without banks. So, already then, the agricultural uh, production collapsed. Um, but there is a Polish uh, left-wing economist you know, called Marcin Piątkowski, I, I just saw him recently, who makes the argument um, that to involve the majority of society in a an, in an, in an modern economy, you actually need to expropriate 
traditional uh, landowning uh, classes, and that almost everywhere, with very few exceptions, it was done by violence. I mean, I'm, I intellectually resist that notion, because of course in Britain and in the United States, if it happened at all, it was done through death taxes and, and taxes in general. But, but I think he's right that in most places it, it was a violent revolution. Yeah, I discussed the issue with Mr. Pankowski, uh -huh. and I don't quite agree with him either. But I mean, the book he wrote this about the Grove in Poland, it's really good actually. Yeah. Um, and about communism, I find it often difficult here when I'm discussing with my my peers and I'm telling them that actually communism is not going to work and they're telling me that it is a good system but like it didn't work they didn't they never invented a system that would work uh, so because it doesn't work so how would you tell the young people who are not Polish that communism is not going to work oh um we had a joke about it in communist Poland um why um why is uh, communism not scientific um, because if it was scientific, they would first have tried it on rats. Okay. I do a, 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 an after dinner speech. I tell the history of communism in Soviet era jokes. Um, what's the difference between democracy and socialist democracy? The same as between a chair and an electric chair. <laughs> Um, what was socialism? The longest road from capitalism to capitalism. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> but actually, recently, I met a Polish Leninist here wow. at Gates. Wow. Wow. Well, I, when I visited North Korea, they told me that they had a branch of the Juche philosophy uh, in, um, in uh, in Warsaw, and indeed there were there were some people start studying the the thought of um, of the great leader. But currently, what is wrongly identified with those far right populist governments is that they are actually conservative, but they have nothing to do with conservatism. Like for example, in Poland, it is claimed that we have a far right far right conservative party, but actually the way in which they work with economy and how society is conducted is actually national socialism. No, they, they think that nationalism plus uh, Catholic fundamentalism is conservatism, and that's just too cruel. It's been cruel for the past few years, and I was wondering how did the changes, how did the regime that was implemented affect you personally? You know, I owe everything in my life to my enemies. Uh, you know, I, uh, I actually told General Jaruzelski this. Uh, because I met him. So I went to Oxford essentially thanks to uh, martial law. Because I was here when martial law was imposed and I claimed asylum. And, you know, otherwise I would not have gone to Oxford. So I said, you know, General, thank you. And, and he, he, I, think he, <laughs> I think he thought it was genuine. <laughs> uh, then, you know, Afghanistan. My first book and you know first steps in journal in journalism. Well, thanks to the Red, Red Army. <laughs> okay, um, I could go on. Um, um, so um, you know, I think they are they are very very bad for Poland. But, um, but personally, I can't complain. There are worse things than being a member of the European Parliament. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about this experience because I remember in one of the books you said that actually the institutions in itself are quite convoluted and you only realize how they function when you went there as a foreign minister. Well, particularly as I spent the 80s and, and partly the 90s here reading British press and, you know, I sort of trusted. You know, when they say that, you know, there's a banana, bent banana directives, you know, I thought, well, there must be something in it, you know. They, they have these crazy directives. And it's all just a lie. And, you know, reading the British uh, press in the 1980s and 1990s, you had no chance of learning how the EU actually works. So, people are convinced here, and some of it seeps into Poland, and I 
but, but, but I try to correct it. People think that a European directive is cooked up by bureaucrats in Brussels and imposed on the member states. But that's how it works. But this is just not true. Um, our president, Mr. Duda, complained at a press conference in, uh, with the president of Germany that the EU, has EU bureaucrats have imposed on us a cruel directive forcing us to use uh, eco-friendly bulbs. And why can't we use the old bulbs, you know, the 100 watt bulbs? Um, so I checked. And it turns out that the uh, idea for such a directive was formulated by the Council of the European Union, which is to say the Prime Ministers, the Member States. Then the Commission, instructed by the Member States, prepared the draft. Um, and it then takes the Commission, the Council, and a democratically elected parliament to simultaneously agree to, to the same draft for a directive to, um, to become law. I can't think of a way of, of making it more democratic. And, and by the way, the, the person who represented Poland at that particular council was President Lech Kaczynski. So, so um, uh, so I'm determined that in Poland, uh, at least there there will be pushback on lies like that, so that um, so that we don't have this logic of that pre prevailed in the referendum that the EU might be bad, but but there but, but, but it's the lesser evil. You know, we can't have that logic. We have to get people to understand how it actually works and to, to have a more mature judgment about its value or otherwise. But it's not only a thing that's happening in Poland that people don't actually understand how the EU works. Uh, there is this bestseller book wrote by Cambridge professor Chris Bickerton, A Citizen's Guide to European Union. And I'm wondering why it takes a Cambridge professor to write a book about how the EU functions. Shouldn't be there are some tools that would explained in a more simple way. I completely agree, and there was such an attempt. It was called the Constitution of Europe, but it was voted down in, in, uh, in Holland and, and France for particular national reasons. Uh, we now have the, the Treaty of Lisbon, which, is, which, which combines all the, uh, all the, the treaties into one. Um, but it's an unbelievably complex institution because it's a product of 70 years of um, you know, unpretty compromises, and it, it, it and it governs, uh, you know, a whole continent of 450 million people. But I, I agree that you know it should be taught in high schools uh, as a, as part of one's civic education. Yeah, people will always bitch and complain about a for you know a, a, a far away seat of power. You know, do you think people in Oklahoma don't complain about Washington? Of course they do. The further away it is, the more suspicious people become. But at least we should not commit sort of fundamental errors, like, like the one I mentioned. Yeah, but there is a tendency to shrink into your nationalist milieu in a way, instead of going global, as globalization. As, sure, as sure of course, because the, because the politicians are elected at home, so they are primed to, to pocket every um, advantage that they've jointly acquired in, in Brussels, you know, and portrayed as, as their own achievement. And, 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 and the price of every compromise, which is inevitable, blame, blame on the institution. And the point is that you can only do it so uh, so long. Uh, um, eventually, you, you drain uh, the fund of trust in in the institution, and and, and it can lead to very dangerous consequences. Um, uh, you know, like Brexit. Uh, so, what's your agenda as an MEP? What are you fighting for? 
Well, I'm on three committees, uh, uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, Defense Subcommittee, and a temporary committee on artificial intelligence. Um, uh, in Foreign Affairs, I chair the largest delegation in the Parliament, Delegation for the Relations with the United States. I conduct hearings, I, 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 I meet with uh, uh, American comrades. Um, we are forming a, another delegation with a new third country, the United Kingdom. And I'll be a member of that delegation and we'll be, uh, we'll be coming and going. Um, and on, um, I also authored the uh, report on relations with China, uh, which uh, was actually supported by almost all the political groups and is now the official uh, policy of the European Parliament towards China. And on, um, on the Defence Subcommittee, I champion uh, something that has already happened, the uh, EU defence budget, and now creating a, an EU military unit. Uh, we've had these battle groups, but they've never been used. I want a unit, um, uh, 5,000 uh, strong brigade, um, that would not be composed of national subunits, but, but of volunteers from member states um, that would be financed from the EU defense budget and under the political control of the Foreign Affairs Council so that it would actually be usable in an emergency. Like this one? Uh, no, Poland is still coping, but potentially. Uh, or, or something in Libya or, 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 or in the Sahel. But, you know, uh, Americans are increasingly uh, um, prioritizing their rivalry with China. If they get into scrapes out there over Taiwan, they will withdraw their forces. We can't be defenseless at that point. Um, we should develop a European uh, capability to, uh, to replace them. Especially we should grow stronger as the European Union that actually COVID crisis showed us if we're so dependent on Asia. Um, well, that's the health union. That's a slightly different issue. But there is a parallel. You know, defense is like, is like preparing for a pandemic. It's something that you, don't, you think is unlikely. It's something you don't want to happen. But if you're unprepared, then it will hit you really, really hard. Uh, you know, defense is also a form of insurance. Um, and, uh, and what I can't get across to my, to my um, uh, rivals, political rivals in Poland, is that at the moment, Poland is defending Western Europe at its own expense. You know, we ha we're having to spend over 2% of GDP while they can spend 1.1, 1.3%. And why? Because they don't feel threatened. If you're Germany, or France, or Holland, or Denmark, and, and so many more of them, you are surrounded by friendly EU member states. Why should you spend money on defense? It was Kissinger who said that we are in the worst geopolitical position that we could have. Well, but, but my, the, 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 we can't do anything about that. But my point is that if we had European defense, then, this, then the financing will be pan-European, but the spending and the, and the location of troops will be where the, where the threat is, which is to say in the east and in the south. And therefore Poland would benefit from it. You know, if they, if they don't want to fight anymore, at least they would finance us. Uh, here's my last question because we need to give the microphone to the audience. But as you are, uh, I've been listening for years now about your idea of creating this European Union. Uh, do you think that there is a place for real politics in the European Parliament? Or is it to, you know, wish you wash in a way that there is a lot of members who have their own agenda, but because of so many scattered ideas, it's actually hard to implement new things? The European Parliament has become very political because the, the, the two largest parties no longer have a majority. For years, the, the uh, European People's Party plus the Socialists had a, an inbuilt majority. 
they no longer do. Uh, so it's much more, um, you know, you, you have to make coalitions, or different coalitions on different issues. Um, and the parliament, I mean, the one thing in which, in which it differs from national parliaments, it doesn't have the right to initiate legislation. In most parliaments, it's pretty theoretical. Because, for example, in the House of Commons, this is so-called members' bills, okay, initiated in Parliament. But they are usually on very marginal issues. In most countries, uh, whoever has the majority and therefore the government controls the agenda of the Parliament. Okay, so we can't do that, um, initiate legislation, but but we can um, appoint or reject the uh, commission. We ratify treaties, uh, and we pass the budget. That's a lot of power. Thank you. This is all for me, and I'm giving the microphone Thank to you. Alex. I need to leave at 6.30, okay? I know. <laughs> this is like, oops. Sorry. This is exactly why I take the microphone. And thank you, Julie, for being here for holding the first part of the discussion session. Now is the time for you to ask any question or to comment on anything that has been said. I'm, uh, I will be passing the microphone around. If you can just speak quite loudly to the microphone so everyone can hear us, even on our line, uh, just introduce yourself and ask the question. Is there anyone who would like to start? There it is. Some question. Here we go. Hello, my name is Wojciech Wysowski. I'm representing the International Trade Group. I want to ask you about uh, uh, if you, you are supporting the project Orca and the Miecznik, the purchase of the ships um, you have to remind you have to remind me the details of these particular uh, uh, programs but you know that the, the Navy has been a, a very sorry story for the last 30 years you know we we've built this patrol ship which is a, which is an antique even before it was uh, finished it took a quarter of a century to build it you know um, and there is a fundamental question about Pol Polish needs as regards the Navy. Uh, I personally believe that we don't need any ships that would be going beyond the Baltics because there are other countries with you know, older and deeper and, and stronger maritime traditions that can do those missions. You just mentioned that they didn't support us even in that conflict with the Belarus. How we can be, let's say that? No, they, I didn't say that. Poland didn't ask for support. That's a different issue. Okay. Um, and it's not a military conflict. It's a, it's a migration issue. Um, so I believe that we need that Poland's primary need is to deny. Um, uh, a potential adversary access to the Polish coast from the sea. That's, that's the number one interest. And when I was defense minister, I bought our first squadron of Kongsberg uh, anti-ship missiles. And my successors then built, uh, added to that. And this means that anything up to 200 kilometers from our shore, we can blow away. Uh, so that fundamental interest is fulfilled. Everything else is extra. I was a strong proponent of developing naval drones and of collaborating with Sweden, which has these high-tech, small frigates and, uh, and submarines. Um, but um, my successes have sort of Sometimes, uh, I, I, I mean, th there have been different concepts, and the result, of the result is that nothing has been purchased, and that uh, uh, the Polish name is in a very sort of uh, party here that will be able to compete, for example, with the Chinese train jet. And I was wondering, do you think it's a good, uh, it's a good argument to to consider something like that, or will it just be, you know, argument? Um, in favor of companies, but it will actually just hurt us customers, in your opinion? It's a very good question, uh, and something on which Europe needs to change its mind. Um, Europe is not failing. You know, ask Google, who've just uh, finally 
uh, lost the case and will have to fork out two and a half billion euros in a penalty if they think Europe is powerless. Yeah. Or ask Apple. I think they've had to pay 11 billion. Um, uh, we are a regulatory superpower. But you're right. The question is what is the market in which you are determining whether there is competition or not? Just the internal market of the EU or the global market in which you have to have continental scale companies in order to compete with the US or with China. And I think five or seven years ago, they made, I think, the wrong judgment that you need competition within uh, the EU. I suspect now that China has become more aggressive and everybody got it, uh, the, the decision will be different. Um, hi, I'm Denise, I'm a student student. Um, I wanted to ask you what's your take on uh, the future of the relationship from, uh, between uh, Poland and the European Union in light of the tensions that have been going on for five years now and the recent or not so recent uh, conditionality, budget conditionality for the recovery funds. Sure. Well, it's not, thank God, it's not yet between Poland and the European, European Union because Poland is a member of the European Union. I mean, in Britain, that's how they talked about it and, and we know what it led them to. You know, they never felt that the EU was us. You know, I, even before the referendum, I would point to my British friends that as you arrive at Heathrow, and you can still see it. From European Union. Yeah, the signs would say arrivals from the European Union. Not within, from. And they haven't, haven't needed to change it since Brexit. Um, no, Poland has a problem with EU institutions. So um, uh, the Euro European Court of Justice has imposed the largest fines in EU history in Poland. On one count, one million euros per day, and on another, half a million, and there are some other cases as well. Um, and, and they they all have a common denominator. Namely, the, the, the current Polish government is um, in breach of both the Polish constitution and the EU treaties. There is no difference. The Polish constitution also requires Polish judiciary to be independent. Um, but of course, nationalists the world over and since time immemorial have needed enemies either real enemies or, or, or created enemies. You know, Fidel Castro, in moments of, um, of, of honesty, ad, uh, used to admit that if he didn't have the US economic blockade, he would have, you know, that if, and, and the US tried to remove it, he would need to carry out a provocation so as to keep it, because that was his alibi for failure. Okay? And the Iranians do it, and the Venezuelans do it, the Venezuelans do it, and the, and the North Koreans do it, and so on. It's politically effective because it mobilizes the, the population um, in, 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 in behind the, uh, whoever is in charge, but of course brings those countries to, to, um, to where they are. And, and that's the logic that needs to be broken. Um, so, and, and in detail, if you ask about this uh, recovery fund, um, uh, which is 750 billion euros of common uh, debt, uh, some of it it's for the member states, some of it is crap. Poland is actually second or third largest beneficiary because the algorithm works to the advantage of a poorer country. Um, and um, the Commission wanted to disperse the money. Uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki came to Strasbourg, I, I watched his speech, and we were convinced that he will say one or two conciliatory things and, and you know, the next week we'll get the, the wire transfer. And instead he made a Farage-like speech uh, denouncing the European Union. So, so the Commission, which was, which was ready to capitulate, couldn't. Um, so, you know, it's, ve I mean, it's very easy. They just need to start um, abiding by our own constitution. 
And on, on, on the dispute with the Czech Republic, you know, we have a lignite mine right on the border. It's literally 500 yards to the border. And just on the other side of the border, in other 500 yards, there is a, bunk, there's a Czech village. And their water is running out because there's this huge half a kilometer deep hole in the ground where the water is. Uh, and they've been saying for years, please build us a water uh, pipe you know, from, from a, a little further afar so that we have our water. And, and the government has been ignoring them. No, they've been praying. Oh, uh, they've been praying. Yeah, that's very efficient. That, that would be very efficient. You know, deputy ministers of this, of this government at a Senate uh, committee hearing told me, yeah, the Czechs are right. You know, if, it, if the border was a little further and it was our village, of course, we would have done it a long time ago. It's a 50 million euro issue. Um, but, but, but these guys are arrogant, incompetent, and ideological. And so instead, we'll, we'll, we're paying a million, uh, a million euro per day. And they think, oh, we're not going to pay. The, commi the, com the commission can just deduct it from what Poland deserves. And it's crazy policy. Under any other government, it would have, would have brought down the government a long time ago. But, we are going to collect a few questions now, because the time is running, unfortunately. Uh, so the first question is here. Right, so first and foremost, it's an honor to have you here today, Mr. Skorsky. Uh, my name is Matas, and I'm a second year non college student here at Things. And as a, law, as a student of law, here's my question. I'm particularly interested in hearing your thoughts on the rapidly changing nature of the Polish course in judiciary towards the European Court of Tribunals its challenging nature and its implications on Poland's uh, relationships with intrastate members, including Spain and Ireland, where I believe their domestic courts have uh, abolished uh, or disregarded, rather, uh, the Polish European arrest warrants because they can't necessarily uh, trust Poland's uh, independence in its judiciary. So based on these aforementioned judicial grounds, do you think Poland would sooner or later exit the European Union and follow in Britain's footsteps? And a special question from our ex-president uh, of KCL Boys Society, Olivia Potter. Hi, so uh, my name is Olivia. I'm a law student here at King's. And my question sort of follows um, up on your question. Um, so my question with the Peace Party is that I think they will not go any further. So that they will, like I thought in 2000, I think 16, that they will not pass these laws that are undermine the independence of judiciary. Then I thought that they were, they will not restrict the abortion laws any further. And I wanted to ask, like, do you think it will ever end? Or like, if they, for instance, lose the elections, do you think they can go as far as to, for instance, disregard the result? Um, and if we as citizens should do anything about it, like protest or like trust that the EU is going to help us. Thank you. You know, the very last nice question, just no, a right. question, and that will be the end of the question from the audience. All right. Um, so, hello, uh, good, <laughs> good evening. Um, my name is Nathan Kowalski, I'm a student here uh, in third year. Um, I wanted to um, ask you a question specifically in your capacity as an MEP. Um, there is this currently ongoing issue that reportedly the Parliament uh, aims to sue the Commission for inaction uh, regarding the uh, violations of rule of law, uh, not just in Poland but predominantly. Um, and um, I wanted to ask, um, first of all, your, your stance upon this. Uh, would you support the, uh, do you support the um, parliamentary effort to do that? And secondly, uh, do you think um, if this case comes to blows in an actual um, a European Court of Justice uh, case uh, and all that, uh, do you think that could mark, uh, for example, an increased role of the parliament um, in the whole uh, system? I'll start with the last. No, I'm not a, a supporter of, of this particular move. Um, it's, it sounds um, convoluted and it's, I think, going too far. And I think the, the Commission is trying to, uh, to, to, to reasonably deal with the situation. 
um, and I think we should just support the Commission. Um, uh, well, you ask if they can go further. Uh, Mr. Jobra, the Justice Minister, who is the author of, of most of the government's troubles with uh, EU institutions, has just tabled a draft law, which he says will modernize the Polish judiciary. But you know, he's been at it for six years, and he's made a complete hash of it. And uh, and, and after his reforms, the Polish judicial system is is in complete chaos. Uh, and citizens have their cases heard. Uh, it takes even longer than before. Uh, and, and the core of this uh, proposal is not modernization, but the purge of all the, of all the judges, reappointment of all judges uh, by this politically construed uh, um, judiciary council, which is to say uh, a verification. Uh, um, according to, um, uh, to ideological criteria. So yes, they, they would like to go further. Whether they will depends on, on their very shaky uh, parliamentary um, uh, majority. Now the real con conundrum that Kaczynski has, and Morawiecki in particular, the Prime Minister, is that they would like the money because they would like to use it as a re-election fund, you know, politically uh, directed investment. But to get the money, they would have to undo the judicial reforms, so-called, that politicize the judiciary. But the justice minister has command, commands a faction uh, of 18 people, 18 me members of parliament. But their majority is three or five. I mean, it changes daily. So they, uh, you know, in order to satisfy Brussels, uh, they might uh, lose power, and you know, faced with that choice, of course, uh, uh, Kaczynski is uh, vigilantes, far-right nationalist groups that organize these marches, um, and, um, and and they and they clearly um, uh, protect them from uh, prosecutions. You know, these people. Uh, hang MEPs in, in effigy, for example, and they're not prosecuted. Or, 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 or uh, one guy uh, was convicted um, uh, for nine months in prison for um, burning a, a, a Jew in effigy, and the justice minister lodged a motion to reduce it to three months. So these are the kinds of people that they are encouraging. Uh, plus they've created this new um, arm of the um, uh, military service called the, 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 the Territorial Defense Force, which is highly politicized. Um, and when you call your opponents traitors, that can be just polemics, but it also can be um, ideological preparation of your own supporters for saying, well, we may have lost the election, but, but can we hand the country over to traitors? Surely not. Um, whether they will succeed is another question. You know, President Trump also wanted to stay in power despite losing the election, and yet there were enough decent people who prevented him. And I think Poland is not Russia or even Hungary in that respect. And I, don't, and I think uh, there's, a, there's a whiff of founder siek, of, uh, of uh, failure around them now. And I don't think many people will want to commit uh, any more crimes to defend them. But these guys are desperate. You know, uh, the justice minister has had charges against him from the National Ombudsman, uh, from the National Accounting Office, for misusing the Justice Fund. 250 million zlotys, which is, yeah, 50 million euros, that was supposed to go for victims of um, crimes, he spent on his pet ideological party causes, clearly a uh, crime. Um, Kaczynski, you know, tried defrauded some Austrian businessmen to do with some towers that he wanted to build in central Warsaw. And all of them have something uh, that they know 
will be re-examined if they lose power. So, you know, they're on that kind of treadmill, you know, that uh, once, you've com once you've broken the law, it's, it's hard to, uh, to go back. Right, yes. <laughs> and the last question uh, was about the European arrest warrant. Uh, well, the Polish government says, no, 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 absolutely, we are not even thinking about prolexia, this is, this is uh, nasty, hostile propaganda. But as you said, quite rightly, Paul exit in the legal sphere is already happening because Polish uh, European arrest warrants are not being automatically respected. You mentioned, uh, I think, Ireland, but it's also in Holland, in Spain. Uh, and, and it's not politics. It's individual judges in those countries asking Polish judges, did you arrive at this arrest warrant independently? In other words, they no longer trust uh, the quality of, and the independence of Polish judiciary automatically. And the EU can only work when all the institutions of all the member states regard one another as equivalent and, the, the, uh, uh, and trustworthy. Um, and so, yeah, the, these guys don't understand how the system work, works. And therefore, like David Cameron, might bring us, take us out of the European Union without meaning to. But, you know, I don't care about their intentions, I, I care about results. Due to time restriction, we'll have to end our event here, but thank you so much for all of those interesting questions, and thank you so much for, uh, to our panelists uh, for coming to Kings and delivering this fascinating session. And thank you for our very <laughs>